Dear listener, I have a question for you. Can we follow the example of Jesus in all things? I'm confident it is the right thing to do and the only example to follow. What does the Bible teach about baptism and what example did Jesus set for us? Listen attentively as Francois helps us to understand this important subject. Whenever I visit Nazareth with its many trees, my thoughts go out to a certain carpenter who worked here many centuries ago. They called him Jesus. At the age of 30, he bade his family farewell and walked all the way from Galilee to the Jordan River where his cousin John was preaching. It's quite a distance. Let's read from Matthew 3, 13 to 15 about an interesting conversation that took place when Jesus and John met. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? Jesus replied, Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. The baptism of Jesus gave this ordinance divine sanction, not only for that time, but for time to come. Jesus said to John that baptism is practiced to fulfill all righteousness. In other words, baptism is an aspect of righteousness in which all can participate. Jesus began his public ministry by giving us an example concerning baptism. And on the Mount of Olives, he concluded his earthly ministry with the following words concerning this important institution. Matthew 28 verses 19 and 20. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I will be with you always, to the very end of the age. Tell me, according to this verse, what does it mean to make a disciple? It is to teach that person everything that Christ had commanded us. In other words, to become a disciple is to become obedient. You're looking at a baptismal service in the Jordan River. In the Great Commission, Christ made it very clear that he required baptism of those who wished to become a part of his church, his spiritual kingdom. I discovered this ancient baptismal font in Israel at a place called Tapha. Question. What relationship is there between baptism and repentance? Let's read from Mark 6 verses 15 and 16. He said to them, Go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. In apostolic times, baptism automatically followed the acceptance of Christ. When you read passages like Acts 8 verse 12, 16 verses 30 to 34, you discover that baptism is a confirmation of the new believer's faith in Jesus as his Redeemer. It is very important to recognize the symbolism of salvation in baptism. For instance, Peter refers to the experience of Noah during the flood to illustrate the beautiful relationship between baptism and salvation. Before the flood, people became so wicked that God warned them to either repent or face destruction. How many people believed the message and entered the ark? 1 Peter 3.20 says, Only a few people, eight in all, were saved through waters. And now Peter says that the waters that kept the ark afloat and saved the believing passengers becomes a symbol of baptism. Verse 21 and this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. And before you think there is something in the water that saves you, Peter concludes by saying, it saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The saving power is not in the water, the symbol, but in him whom the water represents, Jesus Christ. We've discovered in previous lectures that there is a substitute doctrine for every true doctrine in the Bible. Concerning baptism, we read in Ephesians 4 verse 5, One Lord, one faith, one baptism. But today we have people who employ effusion, as you see on this icon, where water is poured out on the candidate. Others employ aspersion or sprinkling of infants and still others baptize people by immersion. 
Our English word baptize comes from the Greek word baptizu that implies immersion. Baptizu is from the Greek word baptu that means to dip or put under water. If you want to change the color of this beautiful Persian carpet, you will have to immerse it completely in fluid. That is the dictionary definition of baptism or baptizu, to dip or put under water. How were people baptized in New Testament times? Let's go back in time and make some interesting discoveries. I wish I could have been here when John the Baptist was still alive. He baptized people in this water. Let's read from John 3 verse 23 and find out more about those early New Testament baptisms. Now John was also baptizing at Enon near Salim because there was plenty of water and people were constantly coming to be baptized. Only baptism by immersion would require much water. When I looked at this mother duck and her little ducks in the Jordan River, I thought of the words of Mark 1 verse 9. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Matthew 3.16 tells us what happened after Jesus was baptized. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went out of the water. I think this is very plain. John immersed or baptized Jesus in the Jordan. After the baptism, Jesus went up out of the water. I once had the privilege of traveling on the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. It was on this road that Philip met the Ethiopian eunuch. Let's read about it in Acts chapter 8 verses 36 and 37. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. The official answered, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. When I saw this pool of water on the Gaza road, I thought of verses 38 and 39. And he ordered the chariot to stop. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptized him. When they came out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Tremendous archaeological discoveries have been made here at Qumran. The people who lived here were called the Essenes and they also baptized their proselytes by immersion. Research has revealed that the rite of baptism by immersion was also practiced before the Christian era. You're looking at the archaeological proof of this statement. The early church continued the practice of baptism by immersion through the ages. Come with me to the fortress of Masada and see what I found there. You're looking at the ruins of an ancient Christian church. How did they baptize members and converts? This font gives you an answer by immersion. Let's travel in a southerly direction to Tel Avdat in the Negev. This used to be an Nabataean stronghold. Let's go in and explore the site. Do you notice the architectural similarity between the early Christian church at Masada and this building? What does it tell you? This must have been a Christian church. Let's walk a little closer. Our conclusion was correct. The early Christians settled here during the 6th and 7th century and built themselves a church called St. Theodorus. This old press worked during the week but rested on the Sabbath. How did these early Christians baptize their young people and new converts? Let's go and investigate. I was so excited when I discovered this ancient baptismal font at Avdat. The evidences for adult baptism by immersion is overwhelming. Discovering new evidences on specific topics when you do research is very rewarding. You're looking at the ruins of another ancient Nabataean city in the Negev called Shifta. Let's walk around. Do you recognize something specific about this church? The architectural style corresponds to the other Christian churches we visited earlier. And guess what I found? An ancient baptismal font. Those early Christians who came to an understanding of the plan of salvation and bore the fruit of the Spirit were baptized in this font. Before we look into the beautiful symbolism of Christian baptism, let us first discover the symbolism of Christ's baptism. Besides setting an example for us, why did he undergo baptism? I'm reading from Psalms 69 verse 1 while you're looking at the waters of Galilee. 
Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. What does covering waters symbolize? Overwhelming trouble and affliction. When Jesus stepped into the waters of the Jordan, he stepped into a prophetic symbol of his future suffering, death and burial. Jesus explains this concept in Mark 10 verses 38 and 39. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with a baptism I am baptized with? Jesus also used his water baptism in Luke 12 verse 50 to refer to his death on the cross. I have a baptism to undergo and how distressed I am until it is completed. The message of the cross was central to the baptism of Jesus. And the message of the cross must also be the central theme of present day baptism. After death follows burial. This is where Jesus was buried after his crucifixion. When Jesus held his breath in the Jordan River, he demonstrated his future death. When John buried him in the water, he demonstrated his burial. And when John raised him out of the water, Jesus demonstrated his future resurrection. Whenever I visit these ancient baptismal fonts, I realize that the early church understood the meaning of baptism by immersion. It conveys such a rich Christ-centered message. Baptism would have had no significance as a symbol of Christ's passion if the early church had practiced a mode of baptism other than immersion. This fellow looks extremely happy. I wonder why. Maybe it is because he stands next to the statue of John Knox, the great Reformation preacher of Scotland. This is the historic church of St. Giles on the Royal Mile in Edinburgh where he preached and said, Give me Scotland or I die. What a preacher. But inside St. Giles I discovered this baptismal font where infants were baptized. When the beautiful truth of baptism by immersion was brought to the Reformation movement, they rejected it and stuck to the Catholic tradition of infant baptism. We discovered that the baptism of Jesus was symbolic of his future death, burial and resurrection. But what does the baptism of the believer symbolize? Romans 6 verses 1 and 2 What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Verse 3 or well, don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Verse 4 We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. What would you say does the expression mean to be baptized into Christ or to be baptized into his death? Well, it speaks of a very intimate relationship with him. In the symbolic act of baptism, the believer enters into the death of Christ. And in a real sense, Christ's death becomes his death. He also enters into the resurrection of Christ, and that resurrection becomes his resurrection. Let's carefully study the beautiful salvation message of baptism. The candidate steps into the water like Jesus did. Can you still remember the symbolism of the water of baptism? They represent a prophetic enactment of the suffering, death and burial of Christ. In other words, the candidate identifies with what Jesus did in order to save him or her. For a brief moment, the baptismal candidate stops breathing. What does that mean? Death to the old sinful way of living but it also represents the death of Jesus on our behalf. Galatians 2 verse 20 I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. When was Paul crucified with Christ? Was he one of those criminals who were crucified with Christ? No, he's telling us that when Christ died on Calvary, Paul's sinful nature died with Christ. This is the wonderful good news. When the sinner stands in the baptismal font, he is testifying to the world that he had been crucified with Christ. But this also points to Calvary where Jesus took our sinful natures upon him and buried them with him in death. Before I baptized this lady, I baptized her son. 
This was a very joyful day in their lives. Paul says in Colossians 2.12, Having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God, who raised him from the dead. You know, we sinners make such a mess of our lives and then we feel so utterly lost. But if we repent and accept his gracious offer of salvation, we are saved. And when one gets baptized, one celebrates the wonderful saving grace of God in the baptismal font. And it is so good to see those tears of gratitude streaming down the faces of these candidates. In Romans 6 verse 4 we read, We were therefore buried with him through baptism into his death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. The minister who baptizes the candidate lifts him or her out of the water. This act refers to the resurrection of Jesus. Just as the Father raised Jesus from the tomb, so too does he want to lift us by his power out of a life of defeat into a new life of victory. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. The only safety there is for us is to always remain in Christ with all the dependence we have. Let us take a few moments to study the kind of preparation one should make before baptism. The Bible compares the relationship between Christ and his church to a marriage. I still remember all the preparations we made when our only daughter told us about her plans to get married. She and her future husband had to build up a faith and trust relationship with one another before they could get married. The same applies to baptism. Mark 16 verse 16 Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Before you undergo baptism, it is vital to have faith in the atoning sacrifice of Christ as your only means of salvation from sin. But Paul says in Romans 10 verse 17 that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Before I baptized this elderly couple, I did what Jesus told me to do. Matthew 28 verses 19 and 20 Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I will be with you always to the very end of the age. Two thousand years ago, Peter preached on the Temple Mount at Jerusalem where the beautiful temple once stood. It was during the feast called Pentecost that he told the Jews that they were responsible for the crucifixion of Christ. I'm reading from Acts 2 verse 36. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Verse 38, Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Instruction in the word of God produces not only faith, but also repentance and conversion. In response to God's call, people see their lost condition, confess their sinfulness, submit themselves to God, repent of their sin, accept Christ's atonement and consecrate themselves to a new life with him. Without conversion, people cannot enjoy a personal relationship with Christ. Only through repentance can they experience death to sin, which is a prerequisite to baptism. John the Baptist says to the Pharisees and Sadducees in Matthew 3, 8, Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Without bringing forth fruit, I will not have met the biblical requirements for baptism. I once visited a church in Athens where I saw the Ten Commandments in Greek. In Romans 6, 11, where Paul discusses the subject of baptism, he says, In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Before a candidate is baptized into the baptismal waters with its rich symbolism, he relinquishes his sinful life. The law of God becomes the standard by which he will henceforth live. 
First John 3 verse 4, everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. Before a person gets baptized, the Holy Spirit will convict him of the seriousness of sin and he will repent. John 3 verse 5, Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. I'm so grateful for the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. If he does not convict us of our sins, how will we ever want to repent? 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 13 For we were all baptized by one Spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free. And we were all given the one Spirit to drink. John chapter 3 verse 23 Now John also was baptizing at Enon near Salim because there was plenty of water and people were constantly coming to be baptized. But in spite of the fact that we need plenty of water to demonstrate the theology of baptism, people today baptize infants. Why? Come with me to a town in Italy called Pisa. The people who live here will tell you that their leaning tower was completed in AD 1260. The building next to the leaning tower is called the Baptistry. It's called by this name because people were baptized here by immersion at least till some time after AD 1260 when the baptistry was completed. Some historians date the official introduction of infant baptism in the year AD 1350. What a sad day. No longer were people baptized by immersion as was the practice here at Ephesus. The new theology taught that babies were born with original sin and they had to be baptized in case they should die early. Unfortunately, infant baptism is only one leg to stand on, and that is tradition, Roman Catholic tradition. But God was sending people with biblical light throughout the ages to dispel the terrible doctrinal darkness. One such man was Roger Williams. According to Froome in Prophetic Faith of Our Fathers, volume 3, page 48, Roger Williams formed the first Baptist church in America in 1638 and reintroduced biblical baptism by immersion. Martin Luther admitted in his book Works, page 319, that according to the meaning of the word, every candidate should be immersed completely under the water and lifted up again. Unfortunately, he never practiced it. But don't be too judgmental. Let's examine our own hearts. How many times do we admit what is right and do not act upon our convictions? Let's watch and pray more fervently. You are looking at the impressive church of John Calvin in Geneva. In his Institutes, Book 5, Chapter 15, Page 19, he wrote, It is very clear that the term baptism refers to immersion. This was the mode of baptism used by the early church. Another great theologian, Karl Barth, admitted that baptism by immersion is biblical. He writes in Church Dogmatics, volume 4, page 179, Nowhere in the New Testament is infant baptism either permitted or commanded. How can I become a part of Christ's body, his church? The Bible says this happens through the beautiful institution of baptism. Let's read it. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free. What would you say is another word for this body of which Paul speaks? He explains it in verse 27 and 28 and says it is the church of God. Ecclesiastes 3 verse 1 says, There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. It could be that God has touched your heart. It could be that you have a desire to make a full surrender and be baptized. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 17 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. The secret of a victorious Christian life is to always remain in Christ before baptism, during baptism, and after baptism. John 10 verse 27 My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. Have you heard his voice telling you to be baptized?
Don't hold back. Acts chapter 22 verse 16. And now, what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on his name. Thank you, Francois. Did you know that thousands of people daily discover the importance of baptism and follow Jesus in his example? What about you? May the Lord bless you as you contemplate the baptism theme. Let us pray. Gracious Father in heaven, thank you that through faith, repentance and baptism we can become part of the heavenly family. And thank you for the example of Jesus who was baptized. Help us to follow in his footsteps. Amen.